We've been talking about and trying to build on the series from Ephesians. And I've taken the last phrase of a, of a, a statement by John Newton. By the grace of God, I am what I am. As an overall theme of the whole thing. The realization is, is that what we're trying to understand is, is that where do we get who we are? As believers, where does that come from? Does it come from what we do, what successes we've had in life? Is it, does it come from our education? Does it come from uh, just being nice to people? Who are we? How do we define what is our identity as believers in Jesus? As believers. And we pointed out... One of the things that we pointed out last week was the fact that even Paul went through this, this situation. In his own personal life, he had, he, was, he had given himself, he was very prideful, he could boast about specific areas of his life. His education, that he was, had the right genealogy, he could trace himself way back to Jacob, you know, and Abraham. He could... Yeah, I'm, I'm right. I'm in Israel. I'm of the right tribe. I was born on the right side of the tracks. I, he was a ben, of Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. That tribe did not go away from God. That stuck cl- uh, closer to the, the temple. After a civil war, after Solomon, a civil war that happened in Israel and Judah. Benjamin was one of those tribes that didn't go away from God, but stayed with Judah. And so he was very proud of that. I'm a Benjamite. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, the apostle said. In other words, he was raised in a place called Tarshish, and the Greek and Roman culture was very clear there. But he was so proud that he would not even allow his religious beliefs to be touched by the culture of, of Greece or Rome. He did not allow that, so he proclaimed, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I got it right. I believe the right stuff. So much so that he became a Pharisee. His education came along. And of course, in producing that in his own life and that pride, being a Pharisee, a professional law keeper, he was meticulous in belief in how to keep the law of God. So much so that it became an ideology to him. An ideology says, okay, that other person that disagree with them, they write them off and becomes hatred because those people are against what I believe, and it's affecting my own belief. My belief. And so Paul ends up persecuting the church. And he's very prideful in this, but it's not until he encounters Jesus. Until he comes out on that Damascus road that his whole life turns upside down because of Jesus. And he's no longer one that goes against the church and and persecutes the church and throws people, Christians, into prison or torturing or death. But he becomes one of them. All because of Jesus. And Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, by the will of God, in Christ Jesus, once he has that, relationship with Jesus. He finds himself in Jesus. His identity's changed now. And now we can hear what God's call upon his life, and so it is Jesus he knows for certain that makes him a sent one or an apostle. He knows. He writes to the saints, and we discovered this together, hopefully, that when Paul talks about to the saints in Ephesus that there are people in, in Ephesus that weren't really holy, <laughs> you know, even by their life. I mean, you get, there got to be a few, right, that 
that aren't really got it all together or perfect, right? And yet Paul writes to them, he says, I'm writing to the saints who are in Ephesus in Christ Jesus. See, the only way that, that holiness or rightfulness can occur is in Jesus. So he's saying, okay, I'm calling you a saint because now you're going to begin and understand since you are in Jesus that you're going to begin to live differently because you're no longer going to live, try to live a perfect life, right? I'm not going to try to earn anything, thank you, Val. I'm not trying to earn anything. I'm not trying to earn God's attention. I'm going to live my life because I'm in Jesus, in Him. I'm a saint, therefore this is the way I'm going to live. And so we can rely on successes, and some people do. And throughout our lives we go, success, success. What are you successful at? I don't know about you, but sometimes when we have successes, it becomes a very prideful thing. Look at me. Look what I can do. Exactly. What can I do? What a, yeah, I, I, I've, 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 I've achieved this. And this morning, we need to begin with God. That's where Paul get, picks up. It's all about God himself and what he has done so that we would be in Jesus. It's not successes of our lives. It says, okay, I've got it. But it's what God has already done. So join with me, Ephesians chapter 1, verses uh, 13 to verse 14. In the Greek text, this is, this is a whole sentence in the Greek text. One whole sentence. It's not broken up in the English like we have it here. But it's one whole sentence, and there's no punctuation. Because you get the impression, as, as Paul is sharing this with the, the people in Ephesus, or these Christians in Ephesus, that he's excited. There's a, like, a, like he, he gets on a roll, and he just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And so bear with me, share with me as I read this. Uh, verse 3, and maybe you can get on the roll with, with Paul, okay? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us and the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mysteries of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will be reached, their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we have also chosen were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also, which included in Christ, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, 
whom is a deposited guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those whose God's possession to the praise of his glory. There's several words that I'd like to, to look through here, but I want us to realize that it's not our successes, it's what God has done. And in this passage of Scripture, we have the Trinity. The Trinity is represented throughout. We have the Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Spirit. And did you catch that? And each in case, over and over again, in this long sentence, he keeps coming back in Christ, in Him, in the Beloved, in the One He loves, over and over and over and over again. You get the idea, it's not about us, it's about him. So he begins. He says, you're blessed. In fact, that, that word praise, that, that, that opening verse 3, some of your translations have this word instead of praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Three times he uses this word or form of it, of blessed. First, blessed be the God and Father. Blessed, he blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So blessing. Hey, you try to get a you got to get blessed some some other way other than from the heavens. Ain't gonna work. <laughs> Not at all. Now you could try, you know, your successes and things in your life and and do all these things, and you want the praise from a whole lot of other people, you receive the blessing. But notice where the blessing is in the heavenly realms. The heavenly realms. It kind of gives us a reflection of the, the ascension of Jesus. Jesus is already there in the heavens. As I mentioned earlier, he's our, to be our treasure. And the blessings are not just here, but in the heavenly realms. Somebody once said the closest, the closest to hell that a believer has is right here on earth. The closest that a non-believer has to heaven is right here on earth. God blessed us in heavenly realms. I'm heading there. That's where all the blessings ultimately are. But then he begins to spell out some of the things the Father does, the Son has done, and the Spirit has done in order for us to be in Jesus, in Christ. And so he begins. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love. Wow. Choice. That's the first word I like to talk about for a moment. God chose us before even when we were existing. Before we were born, before creation, he chose us. He did. Now, what, well, on what basis did God do that? Well, we have some in Scripture about choosing the God's choices and how he makes the choice. One way... One thing that it's, the Scripture says that, that Israel was chosen by God. To be God's chosen. Let me just read to you the basis on which God chose Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, you don't have to turn there, but I will, so I can read it to you. In chapter 7 of the book of Deuteronomy, we have God saying this to the people of Israel. The Lord did not set his affection on you and chose you because you were more numerous than other people. For you were fewer of all people. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery and the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The basis on which 
God chooses Israel has nothing to do with them. He says, you're not even a large group of people. There's not many of you. You're not really great. There's nothing about you. But God says, I loved you. And chose you, Israel. The Apostle Paul picks out uh, in 1 Corinthians... And he talks about God's choice. And he's speaking to the Corinthians, who the Corinthians themselves are, you know, non, not necessarily holy people, okay? In fact, to be from Corinth, that was kind of the slang, you know? You, to be, be a Corinthian, live a Corinthian lifestyle, that was not, that's not nice to say about people. But this is what Paul says about God's choosing. 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 26, we read these words. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and that the things that are not do he nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. If it is, be it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God and that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boast, boast in the Lord. It begins. Paul says, okay, before time begins, he says, this is what the fathers did. Saw you, and he loves you. You feel that? He loves you. He chose you. It's like, like in the olden days where, where a child is born. In the olden days, nowadays, the, the dads get to go into the, the place for the birth, right? But back in the day, the dads used to have to sit out, in the, out there, you know, out in the thing, wait for the baby to be born. And so the, the nurse comes and he she places... A baby into that room, you know, behind the glass. And uh, there's a whole lot of other babies in there. And dad gets so excited, he goes and he runs to that place and he looks through the window and that's what he does. That's my kid. That's my child. Ah, that's my kid. Right? That's what God did for us before the world began. God saw us. He says, that's my kid. You feel that? You can tell why Paul is excited here. That doesn't stop. He, he keeps, he's still on a roll. The second word I like to pull out here is the word adoption and say this here. He said, he, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Christ Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will. Adoption. Goes along with the choosing, we understand this. He says, you're my kid, but not only you're going to be my kid, you're getting adopted. And I've thought about this, and maybe think, think with me, what happens when, when a child is adopted? 
you know, obviously, obviously it, there's a choice involved there, right? You, the family, I don't know, maybe there's a drawing because of love or whatever, and the child is chosen. But what else happens to the child when the child is adopted? Let me, let me, add, let me, just a couple of thoughts here. Something happens to the child's name. Get it? Their name changes. They got a different name that say you get the new last name. That's another thing. Resources change. Now you're part of a family. Family. You become part of the family. And for some of you, I don't know whether any of you have been adopted. I, but I hope if, if you've had a tough growing up and you've come to Jesus and you did, your family is just kind of messed up or whatever you want to say, my prayer for you is that you would find here your family because of Jesus. You have a family. You're adopted by the Father, and your name changes, and you become have new resources. You become part of... Now, you know another thing that happens? That that child that's adopted into the family he takes on a new history, too. History changes for them. For that child. Now, since you're part of that family, guess what? All the family history comes along to that child. They're part of that. There's a heritage. So when it says that, that God chose, God predestined us to be adopted as sons, you get a name change? Become part of a new family? Maybe that we didn't ever had before. We could become part of God's family. And thirdly, we pick up a new history because we have an older brother now who's Jesus. New history. The old is gone, the new has come. A different history. This is what the Father does. And he does it in accordance with what pleases him and his desire to do it. It says, in accordance with his pleasure and will. He loves doing this. He enjoyed doing this. It wasn't like, oh, I saw you. Okay, I'll pick you. That's not what God does. He says, we saw you, and now, okay, I love you. You're mine. You're in my family. What does the Son do? Verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. The word I want to pick up here is the word redemption. Redemption. Now nowadays, a lot of times we talk about addiction. People are addicted to something. The word redemption here has the concept in relationship to slavery. Slavery, to be enslaved. And a person that's gone through addiction definitely know what it means to be enslaved. Right? It goes back to a time in which in which Israel is delivered out of Egypt that last night, and God redeems his people out of Egypt. A payment is paid. Something is paid. Has to be to redeem something. Some, some exchange has to happen. In the case of the redemption, it is the blood. It goes back to Egypt. And they were to kill a lamb, and they were to put the blood on the doorposts 
And death doesn't come because upon that house, because the blood is on the doorpost. Paul said we have redemption through his blood. Whose blood? The blood of Jesus. There's an exchange that goes on. I, just try, I was trying to think of how, how to illustrate this, and it, it, it caused me to think about way back. How, some, of you, some of you may have experienced this when you're, you're growing up. Did you, your parents ever collect, or mom or dad, collect top value stamps or green stamps? You know, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, all right. Green stamps. You would get those things, and you would go to the go into the the uh, gas station, other places, and you fill up your tank, and they will give you stamps. Okay, and what were you supposed to do with those stamps? What you were supposed to do was to fill a book, right? You filled the book, you filled the book, filled it. Okay, and then you got a catalog, right? And they even back then, when I remember, there were stores, right? Green stamp stores or top value stores. And what did you do, end up doing with the stamps that you've collected? All right? You purchased something with it, right? You had an exchange going on here. All right? You gave them the stamps, and you got whatever yet you were saving up for, right? There's an exchange that occurs. In this case, when we're talking about redemption, there's an exchange that goes on. It's through the blood of Jesus, through his blood, there's an exchange. And Paul mentions some of these things. Because of the blood of Jesus, it says, he says, we have forgiveness of sins. We have the riches of God's grace. And this is what I like too, that he lavished, lavished on us. It's great. The exchange of the blood of Christ, we, we have forgiveness given to us that we can be forgiven of sin. Some of us, I mean, we, we push that off. We do something wrong and say it's the other guy, it's his fault, or we complain some way. We just don't ask God's forgiveness because he's already through the cross. And we have forgiveness of sin. He, through the blood of Christ, we have the riches of God's grace that he lavishes on us. And I, and I like that. And, you know, I almost get this picture. I, I, when, I, when I hear that word lavish, I don't know. I remember, I remember at breakfast time when we'd have waffles. <laughs> and we would play, play, see if we could fill all the holes with the syrup. Did you ever do that? I mean, I can remember. And you just, you poured it on and you kept pouring it on and kept pouring it on. Well, that's the word lavish. He lavished. And it's more than just God giving us grace. It is the word engracing us. Engrace. To engrace. Engrace. E-N. Engrace. In other words, in God's grace, it's not just him giving this. It's like he's wrapping us around. He's engracing us, right? We are in his grace. It's as if our Father, through Jesus, is giving us a hug. I don't know. You know, he's engracing us. He's giving us grace. We talked about what is grace. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Grace is also the ability to do, to live the life. In Jesus. It's God's grace. By God's grace, I am what I am.
What's going to happen? He embraces us. The choice has happened. And Paul says now, remember, times are going to go on, and it's going to continue on until everything's fulfilled in Jesus. Ultimate fulfillment, Christ becomes the head over all. And what he's saying, he says he's not just over all Christians or believers. He's the head over all. Meaning, if you don't know Jesus and come to Jesus and, and find Jesus your hope and finding yourself in him, he's still going to be your head. You won't like it. You may not like that. But if you have a relationship in Jesus and you come to that day when all time is fulfilled in him, it's in Jesus. And he becomes the head. He is the head. And I look at that differently than somebody that is not a Jesus. So the scripture says, Jesus, uh, Paul says, to be put into effect this purpose in Jesus. The purpose to be effect. Times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. He goes on, in him we also chosen having and predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything a conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who have first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth the gospel of salvation having believed. Next word is the word believe. Believe. You see, we have redemption. We have all these things. We have all these things are blessing coming from the Father in the heavenlies. All these. But he says, when you believe, right, God knew it. And his whole desire was that ultimately you would believe. Right? That you would believe. So that ventured to say, this run through your head at the moment I'm reading the scripture, how do you know that I'm chosen? That God actually lavished upon me his grace? How do I know? That God loves me. How do you know before time began that you were chosen? Right here. And you also are included in Christ when you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. You want to know whether you're chosen or not? Do you believe? It's one old-time preacher. I forget exactly which one. I was trying to come up with the name actually this morning. Trying to, to, to have an understanding of what that's all about. He uses this illustration... And you died, you've gone to heaven. On the one side of the gate, it says, whosoever will may come. And you enter the gate, and you turn around, and you look up, and over the top of the gate, it says, chosen in the beloved. Matter of perspective. It really is. God's viewpoint our viewpoint but if you want really to know that you're chosen that God had made that choice in your case if you have any questions about that if you're having questions about that 
Mm, you're not far from believing. Are you? If you're saying, oh, no, I'm not too sure. And, and just let's, let's put this in perspective too. How many of you actually, before you came to Jesus, really sought Jesus? Actually says, yeah, 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 I, you know, where are you, God? You, you, you. How many actually had that in mind? I'm going to set my mind and I'm going to find God. Some do, some don't. But here's the thing. I've heard so many stories of people who've been into heavy things in their lives. I mean, it's hard stuff in their lives. They're not seeking God at all, and all of a sudden, God shows up in his, their life, and they go, wow. And God turns them around like Paul. Somebody's into drugs, they're an addict or whatever, and, and they have no thought about God at all, and all of a sudden something happens. And they become a believer in Jesus. And I'd say, a person, evidence of God's work in choosing. But lastly, the last word that I like to lift up here is the word seal. Okay? Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal of promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteed in the inheritance until the redemption of those whom God's possession to the praise of his glory. Word seal. He says, when you believe, you're given the Holy Spirit as a seal. That, this word seal is very interesting. It's a mark, definitely a mark that's placed upon us as a believer. It is the Holy Spirit, him, person. He is placed in our lives, marks us out. Okay? Now, back in the day back many years as kings were ruling and so forth, one of the things that they would do when they would do a, um, maybe even in the 1800s, I would think, one of the things that when they sent a message or a letter, they would use parchment, they'd fold it in half, and what would they do? They would melt wax, they put it on the thing, and they would use their ring, the sigmet ring, and they would push it down in there, and it, what did that say? That letter, this thing that's being passed on to you, is from me. That was the king's mark. The king's seal. Right? This is throughout other places. The king, king and, and in fact, if it was a forest, and you had some logging going on, how did you know that the log, these logs that are being cut down belong to the king? Well, they would put a stamp on it or burn a mark in it. When Paul says this and writes this to believers, this is what God has done. This is the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the seal upon our lives. And it is, he is a promise or guarantee that the inheritance is there. We're back to the heavenly realm again. Right? The blessings in the heavenlies. The inheritance laid up for you. This particular word, seal, is used in the book of Revelation. And this is pretty strong. It's used in the book of Revelation for one angel who comes and the devil, Satan himself, is thrown into the pit. And he's chained. And it says, over the pit, the angel puts a seal on it. 
And during that time, uh, for, for a period of time of a thousand years, Satan doesn't have free reign. One angel. But the idea is that he's sealed up. It's closed. There's no way he's going to do anything. Same word used here. The seal. I have people or heard people say, could I ever lose this? This salvation from God. Can I ever lose it? It is a question, isn't it? But that may be the wrong question, isn't it? It's the wrong question. And I like this. I didn't, it didn't come from me. And it's just a reminder. Has God ever lost anybody? Has Jesus lost anybody? Ever lost anybody? Has God ever lost anyone who is in Christ Jesus? If you have any questions about that, I suggest open your heart and trust Jesus as your Savior. Because that's what that seal means of the Holy Spirit. He is the seal. He is the mark. He said, it says, you belong to me. Just as God the Father said, I've chosen you. I love you. And the Son says, okay, bottom line, why does God do all this? The Trinity. Why do they do that? Why did God do that? Why did he save us? Why did he choose us? Why does, does he give us the seal of the Spirit? Why? For what reason? So that we could stand there and go, Oh, man, look at me. I got God's love. Is that that? Is that, what, is that what it's all about? Is it just because, oh, I prayed the prayer, and therefore I got pride in that because I prayed that magical prayer, and now I'm a Christian. Is that what that's about? That's not why God did it. Not for us to look good. The reason God did it is so that he would look good. You understand what I'm saying? Three times he uses the same phrase through this passage. Did you catch it when I was reading it? So that under the praise of his glory. Unto the praise. When he, that section about the Father, or the Father, unto the praise of his glory. Glorious grace. With the Son, a redemption, so that you would be to the glorious, glorious, the glory of him. Even that last little phrase concerning the sealing of the Holy Spirit. It says, to the praise of his glory. So this whole thing of redemption, all this stuff, has not about our successes. It's not about any of the stuff that we are so prideful about. It's none of that. It's all about him. And our identity should be as believers in Christ Jesus. Why? For the glory of God. Let's pray.